This is a new day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. The Lord be with you. Welcome, happy Father's Day. It's good to see each of y'all here this morning for this Father's Day weekend and for our a fifth Sunday in the Pentecost season. And so we're glad to have you all here and have you for worship today. And what a beautiful day and what a nice breeze. I mean, gosh, uh, we needed it last week and we need it this coming week. And so I'm just glad we have it here on Sunday. So what a beautiful day uh, to be here today. Uh, I invite you uh, to turn in your hymnals toward the back of your hymns. Faith of Our Fathers, hymn number 710. Number 710, Faith of Our Fathers. If able, please stand as we sing all three verses. Uh, Godspell. Let me re-announce uh, that as I did last Sunday. Uh, this coming weekend, or actually I think it's Thursday, Friday, Saturday, 23rd through 25th, uh, and then the 30th of July 1st, we have the Plaza Arts Center. Hopefully you've seen these flyers around, uh, but if you have a chance, I hope you will go and support uh, the artwork <clears throat> by Opus, uh, the Arts Barn, and then the Plaza Arts Center. I hope you can be a part of it. 7.30 for those. So I hope you can be a part Scripture reading today comes from Luke chapter 8, verses 26 to 39. Uh, I'll be reading from the Common English Bible. This is uh, the story of the uh, Gerasene demoniac uh, uh, that we see in the Gospel account. Uh, Luke chapter 8, beginning with verse 26. Jesus and his disciples sa sailed to the Gerasenes' land, which is across the lake from Galilee. As soon as Jesus got out of the boat, a certain man met him. The man was from the city and was possessed by demons. For a long time he had lived among the tombs, naked and homeless. When he saw Jesus, he shrieked and fell down before him. Then he shouted, What have you to do with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I beg you, don't torture me. He said this because Jesus had already commanded the unclean spirit to come out of the man. Many times it had taken possession of him, so he would be bound with leg irons and chains and placed under guard. But he would break his restraints, and the demon would force him into the wilderness. Jesus asked him, What is your name? 
Legion, he replied, because many demons had entered him. They pleaded with him not to order them to go back into the abyss. A large herd of pigs was feeding on the hillside, and the demons begged Jesus to let them go into the pigs. Jesus gave them permission, and the demons left the man and entered the pigs. The herd rushed down the cliff into the lake and drowned. When those who tended the pigs saw what happened, they ran away and told the story in the city and in the countryside. People came to see what had happened. They came to Jesus and found the man for whom the demons had gone. He was sitting at Jesus' feet, fully dressed and completely sane. They were filled with awe. Those people who had actually seen what had happened told them how the demon-possessed man had been delivered. And then everyone gathered from the region of the Gerasenes, asked Jesus to leave their area because they were overcome with fear. So he got into the boat, returned across the lake, and the man for whom the demons had gone begged to come along with Jesus as one of his disciples. But Jesus sent him away, saying, Return home and tell the story of what God has done for you. So he went throughout the city proclaiming what Jesus had done for him. This is the word of God for the people of God, and we say thanks be to God. As we enter our time of prayer meditation, we definitely want to continue to be with the Bradley family, uh, and I think that service is this week. Do you know any details? Uh, Friday? Friday? Twenty Saturday, okay. Two o'clock Saturday, so um, I hope you can be of support to the Bradley family for the community, because I think it's been a, a shock and a difficulty throughout the community and a, a very tragic situation. So uh, do be in prayer uh, for all of those involved. Any other uh, concerns or updates or prayer requests? Let us bow for prayer. We've gathered once again, O oh God, in this place to come and to worship you. And even in the midst of the heat of summer, O oh God, we realize the blessings that are all around us. We realize all the gifts that you've given us, the privileges that we've had in life, the various things that have really come our way, especially the parental influences that we've had. I'm thankful for what Ali Key meant to my life, and I know others here can look toward their paternal influences and just realize, Lord, the difference that it made. Now, maybe it wasn't a biological father, maybe it was an early boss, or maybe it was a male school teacher, or maybe it was some other individual within the neighborhood or in the church or somewhere that really took an interest and molded and shaped us into the people that we are today. I know that I would not be here today where I stand if I was not on the shoulders of my parents. So we say thank you, O oh Lord, even for those parents who've gone to be with you, the ones who are no longer with us. We remember them fondly today, and in our hearts we say thank you for what they meant to us. And what an important dynamic it is for generations generation for folks to continue to take that responsibility to influence those of future generations whether it's a church family giving scholarships to well-deserving collegiates whether it's us taking chance to mentor within the school system or us just taking interest in the neighbor's child uh, our grandchild uh, and the grandchildren that we have amongst us as well 
So help us to take that responsibility seriously, Lord, because uh, those kinds of influences make a difference in lives and it makes a difference in our society. Because a society without parental influence is a society that's in trouble. So help us exercise, Lord, individually and collectively, those responsibilities and help it make a difference here in this life of the area. Lord, for the concerns of the world, we don't want to neglect those because we continue to see war happening throughout the world. Of course, Ukraine tends to be the one we see the most, and yet there's still war in other places of Myanmar and of Sudan and in Congo and Ethiopia and a variety of other places, Lord. There's violence in our streets, even at the potlucks uh, that churches are having. And in each of these tragic situations, Lord, we lift up all those involved and the lives that have been shattered and the grieving families and the communities that don't know what happened. Help us as a society to really find ways that we can make a difference and can tamp down this kind of violence that is continuing this uncertainty that happens as we live just normal lives and go to normal places. We do pray for our safety, O oh Lord, but not just selfishly. We pray for safety for all. For folks deserve to grow up in a safe environment. Help us to do our part to create a safe world. And Lord, you, the Prince of Peace, we just pray that it will permeate lives, our own first, and then the lives of our community, lives of our nation and world. We just pray that your peace will penetrate throughout society and we can live in peace. We pray all of this in the name of Jesus, the one who taught us to pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Two six-year-olds were struggling with the problem of the existence of the devil. And one boy said, well, there isn't any devil. And the other was rather upset and said, well, what do you mean that there's not any devil? It talks about him all the time throughout the scriptures. It talks about the devil. What do you mean there is no devil? And the first replied, oh, you know that's not true. It's just like Santa Claus. It's only dad. <laughs> so happy Father's Day, everybody, okay? Happy Father's Day. How do you picture Satan? Okay? We, we've become so sophisticated as a society, we've become sophisticated as a church, to where we rarely ever talk about Satan, we rarely talk about the evil one. What do you think about Satan? Now, I no longer believe Satan is a humanoid. I'm not one that sees him as a kind of uh, individual with horns and, and a bearded goat and a devilish grin and a, a pointed tail and a pitched fork. I don't view that way. I'm not even sure the evil one is humanoid. I think that maybe there's a greater force that is there that we have to deal with. And actually, to be honest, I think the devil would be quite happy if you did think of him as having a pitchfork and a pointed uh, tail and things. He'd be easy to kind of pick out in a crowd, and he'd be easy to vo avoid that way. There'd be no chance of the devil kind of sneaking up and catching us, you and me, unprepared. We would see him coming. We'd be able to see him coming actually a mile away. The Bible doesn't picture Satan as being like this at all. Someone once wrote, if I were an artist illustrating the story of Jesus being tempted by the devil, I would draw Satan as a very pleasant looking person. So nice that it'd be difficult to tell which was Satan and which was Jesus in the picture. This person is saying that the devil comes to us in disguise. 
When he tempts us, he does it in such a way that you don't even know that you're being tempted. But hey, wait a minute. We're living in the 21st century. All this talk about the devil and demons, this garrison demoniac, was all right for people back in Jesus' time. It was even okay for people in the 15th and 16th centuries. Oh, but you and I, we and our society have come a long way since those times, and we joke about the devil. I grew up with Flip Wilson, I'm assuming you did too. The devil made me do it. And we don't take him or the force that is around him, ever how you view it, we don't take it seriously. Besides what was once called demon possession in Jesus' time, oh, it can be easily explained by modern medicine. We know that epilepsy was thought to be a form of demon possession at one time, and many other sicknesses were seen as a result of sin or as the influence of Satan. And of course, probably the most famous depiction of demon possessed, how can any of us forget the movie, The Exorcist? If your parents let you watch it, that's the question. Uh, my mother never knew I saw it. <laughs> I have heard that it, you know, it's based on an, an actual case. And, and it's an amazing part of the amount of effort that is required in that movie just to be the devil. Anybody who does exorcisms officially within the Roman Catholic Church will tell you how difficult the dynamic can be as they deal with it. They would say Satan is quite powerful. Satan is a cunning enemy. He is not a cartoon figure. But he is real and dangerous. And the Bible urges us to take him seriously. Jesus took Satan seriously. In fact, he sees the whole ministry as his, his whole ministry as a conflict with Satan, with the evil one. He teaches about the power of Satan. He saw his death as the supreme battle with the evil one. Jesus isn't just a child of his age. And he's repeating what he had learned from others. He speaks definitely and personally about the power of Satan. And he continues to warn about that power. If Jesus takes him seriously, then I think we should also. Today's gospel reading tells us of one of those occasions when Jesus confronted Satan. Oh, it's a scary situation. Jesus and the disciples, they had just sailed across Lake Galilee and had been put ashore when suddenly a naked wild man came rushing toward them, screaming and yelling. He lived like an animal in the nearby uh, burial, uh, burial uh, caves there in the cemetery. And we're told that demons, demons had taken over his life. He, he had become uncontrollable. He had become quite dangerous. The townspeople rugby tackled the man and put chains on him and on his feet. But the wild man had superhuman strength and he snapped the chains. He cried out in loud, often inhumane voices, cutting himself with stones as he gave out wild screams. And it seems the townspeople and the wild man had come to some sort of understanding. The wild man would live outside the town in burial craves so that when the uh, man was tormented by demons and he became wild and uncontrollable, he wouldn't harm anyone else. And everyone knew that the place where Jesus had landed was by common consent a no man's land. As the wild man rushed downhill from the tombs, eyes crazed, screaming at the top of his lungs, it must have been a frightening sight for Jesus' disciples. Perhaps they considered jumping back into the boat or, or jumping on the man as a group or hoping that combined strength would contain him. Well, the demons recognized Jesus. They were afraid. They knew Jesus had the power to send them back to where they came from. Jesus demonstrates his power by simply asking, well, what's your name? The demons were in control of the wild man, but Jesus was in control of the situation. He commands them to come out and to enter a nearby herd of pigs. 
When the local people from the town come out to see what was going on, they were shocked of what they saw. This once wild man was sitting at the feet of Jesus, clothed and in his right mind. He was saying once again. Now there's much to be said about this text. You can preach this text in a number of different ways. I have over the years, but there's one clear message. And it's the message that we need to take from this place. Because whatever you think about Satan, whatever you think about the evil and the evil within our world, as we hear week after week after week after week, one shooting after another shooting after another shooting, as we watch Putin t- destroy the country of Ukraine and try to wipe it out in the midst of it, as we see this kind of evil stuff happening over and over and over again, we need to be reminded by the one clear message of this text. Even though Satan is powerful, the power of Jesus is even stronger. In fact, Luke has placed this event amongst other demonstrations of Jesus' power. Immediately before this story, we find Jesus commanding the wind and the waves to be quiet. Jesus need only speak the word and the great calm fell on the lake. Jesus was more powerful than the destructive forces of nature. Then immediately after the expulsion of Satan from this wild man, Luke tells us that Jesus had the power to heal. He restores to health a woman who's been ill for 12 years. She had examined by an untold number of doctors, but they were unable to heal her. But Jesus did. Jesus did what had been humanly impossible. He has the power. And this is where we as the church need to understand this once again. He has the power to control disease. Viruses. Bacteria. Bleeding, epilepsy, leprosy, cancer. He has the power to heal the incurable. So within these three texts that are side by side by side, we see when the hurricane comes, when the tornado is on its way, Jesus is more powerful. When all of a sudden demonic dynamics and evil looks like it's running everything, Jesus is more powerful. But when all of a sudden the disease has come on us, we've gotten the doctor's report, no matter what we're facing in the days ahead, Jesus is more powerful. In fact, he even had the power to raise the dead. He went to the home of a 12-year-old girl who had died. No one could do anything for her except to mourn the passing of the young life. They had been powerless in the face of death. They could not stop it from taking the girl's life. They even made fun of Jesus when he said she was only sleeping. Dead was dead as far as they were concerned. They underestimated the power of Jesus. He took the child by the hand and to everyone's amazement, he brought her back to life. Jesus could even command the dead to rise. He was more powerful than death itself. I'm especially glad that Jesus has all the power and all the authority when it comes to Satan. I'm especially glad, simply because Satan is far more powerful than you and I are. Satan blinds us. Paul says in 2 Corinthians, the God of this age, that's the devil, has blinded the minds of unbelievers so they cannot see the gospel of the glory of Christ who is the image of God. We might have heard the same message from the Bible over and over and over again. But Satan blinds us to what God is trying to say to us. We close our ears and we interpret what is said in our own way and we refuse to apply what God is saying to our lives. Satan wants to control us, to possess us, to tempt us to do what is against God's plan for our lives. To lead us astray by telling us that wrong is right and the truth is a lie and that God does not love us. Satan wants to influence us, to hinder us from doing what we know God wants us to do. Satan loves bitterness, hatred, (coughs) 
violence, arguments. Oh, he loves dividing people, especially dividing families and churches. He can enter the hearts of people and cause so much harm. Drunkenness, drug abuse, greed, road rage, vulgar language, racial prejudice, abusiveness, despair, sexual promiscuity. I'm sure you get the picture as to what he can provide. The power of Satan is nothing to mess around with. <coughs> Having said all that, you might begin to wonder, do you and I, do we have any chance against such a formidable foe? We all know how easy it is for us to succumb to his temptations, and we think everything is going okay, and then bingo, we suddenly realize that Satan is leading us along by the nose. Sometimes, sometimes we're not even aware that he's having such a powerful influence in our lives. So we can stand up. So can, how can we stand up against something so, so powerful? And the answer is simple. We can't. Not by ourselves anyway. That's not to say that we shouldn't try to resist Satan and his temptations and not give in to his attempts to lead us astray. James chapter 4 tells us, so then submit yourselves to God and resist the devil and he will run away from you. We need a power that is far greater than any power we have in ourselves. We need the power of Christ on our side if we are going to resist the devil, the evil one. Satan wants to, to draw us away from God's kingdom into his dark realm. Daily he tempts us. Daily he tries to draw us away from God. And he tempts us so that we fall under God's condemnation and be sent to hell. But you see, Jesus has broken Satan's power. Remember I said before that the whole life of Jesus is an attack against the domination of the devil. And the climax of that battle occurred on the cross of Calvary. On the cross, Jesus broke the stranglehold that Satan can have over all of us. He, he, Jesus won for us forgiveness for all of the times that we give in to Satan. Christ has redeemed us, and that means he has brought, bought us back from sin and to Satan with the price of his own blood. He has reclaimed us as his own, and he has made us his dear children. He's made us new. He's given us a fresh start. He's given us the Holy Spirit to help us resist Satan's power. Satan may tempt us, and we may give in. We deserve God's punishment, but his death and resurrection, but through his death and resurrection, through the waters of baptism, we belong to God. We're forgiven. We're free. We are called to follow in Jesus' footsteps and likewise resist the devil. Paul says in Ephesians 6, Let the mighty strength of the Lord make you strong. Put on the armor God gives you so you can defend yourself against the devil's tricks. And when the battle is over, you will still be standing firm. Our story from Luke's gospel concludes, the man went through the town telling what Jesus had done for him. And just as Jesus commissioned the once wild man to go back home and tell what God has done for you, he has also commanded us, you and me, to share that same good news of freedom from the evil one's power to anyone, absolutely anyone, who will listen. Jesus wants every person, every person in this nation, every, in this community, in this nation, in this world, they, uh, Jesus wants every person to say what Paul said there in Colossians 1. God rescued us from the dark power of Satan and brought us into the kingdom of his dear son. And for that, we say thanks be to God. Amen. I invite you to get your hymnals and turn to hymn number 701. When we all get to heaven, we'll sing the first and the fourth verse.
first and last verses, hymn number 701. If able, please stand and join us as we sing. Whatever it is, the way you celebrate. Uh, stay safe, stay cool this week. Try not to get out in the heat of the afternoon uh, and drink lots of water. Let us bow for our closing benediction. Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. Where there is hatred, let me sow love. Where there is injury, pardon. Where there is doubt, faith. Where there is despair, hope. Where there is darkness, light and where there is sadness, joy. O Divine Master, grant that I may not so much seek to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love. For it is in giving that we receive, it is in pardoning that we are pardoned, it is in dying that we are born to eternal life. Amen. Thank you for being here this morning for our service. Thank you for joining us on the internet. Hope you'll join with us every week here at 9 o'clock. If you're in the Lake Erie, come join us in person. We're here at the Reynolds Pavilion until the uh, end end of September 1st of October. So please come join us in person. Hope you have a great, happy Father's Day weekend this weekend. Uh, If you're listening to us on the internet, you can also listen to us on the radio. Get the app from Doc 103.9. Get their app. You can hear us from anywhere in the world. Uh, but that's from 7.30 to 8.30. And this replay from 10 to 11 on 7. Hope you can join us again next Sunday. Thank you.